Okay. Welcome, friend. We're taking a look today at Ogre, sometimes called Ogre 3D, which is a 3D rendering library in C++. We've looked at a few uh, 3D rendery or gamey things, uh, and those will be in the, um, in the description. Things like Blender and uh, Godot Game Engine, and we just finished looking at OBS. So I expect this to be in more or less the same vein. The um, we see here the class library abstracts all the details of using the underlying system libraries like Direct3D and OpenGL. So that's a that's a common theme we've seen in basically all of these. That uh, the um, nobody wants to use the libraries directly, really, just because of portability reasons. And so very often there is uh, there is a library like this that will let you do all those things. We have some, so let's take a look at the code. We have, um, I think it said C++, 79.3% C++. That's good, I like C++. Um, there's a little bit of C and some Objective-C and GLSL, which sounds like some sort of like, um, Declarative configure language. Was it G G L S L? Something language G L shading language. Okay, there we go. Okay. Uh so I assume most of the stuff is in SDK render systems. Oh no, Ogre Main. That looks the most promising so far. And then media and components, maybe we'll just open up to uh to take a peek. SDK, what do we have? What do we have? We have Android, and that's fine. I guess maybe it supports Android. Under render systems, we see, I guess, what you might call the backends, Direct3D 11, Direct3D 9, GL, GL3+, Metal, which I think is like the uh, Mac thing, Tiny, uh, maybe like Tiny GL, that's, I think a thing, and Vulkan, which I forget who does what. The metal Vulcan. Let's look these up one at a time. Vulcan uh, 3D. Let's try. Vulcan is a low level, low overhead cross platform API and open standard for 3D graphics to address the shortcomings of OpenGL. Who made it? The Kronos Group. So, whoever the Kronos Group is, they like old gods. Kronos, I think, being the the uh, creator of the father of Zeus, the guy who eats his children. Vulcan is the um, um, the Greek version of Hephaestus, right? The uh, hammer guy, black the blacksmith. No, not that one. It's the Hungarian name for the city of Vulcan. Uh, Vulcan with a C, I guess. The god of fire, volcanoes, metalwork, and the forge in Roman mythology. Oh, Hephaestus is, is, yeah, that makes sense. Hephaestus is the Greek version. Vulcan's the Roman version. Kronos is Greek, I thought. The leader and youngest of the first generation of Titans in Greek mythology. Cool. Uh... The Titans are the divine descendants of the primordial Gaia in Uranus. He overthrew his father and ruled during the mythological golden age until he was overthrown by his own son, Zeus. I guess Uranus is the one who eats. Well, I don't remember. Let's not look it up. Okay. Uh, all right. So here's Vulcan. Um, now, this seems to be so Vulcan seems to be multi platform and it's competing with OpenGL. And then Metal is, uh, let's try maybe Metal 3D. Let's try Metal 3D outside of Wikipedia search. Mm, let's try Metal Apple. Metal Overview. Here we go. Metal is a low level, low overhead, like literally the same um, intro. I guess maybe they've uh, standardized 
Some of this stuff, hardware accelerated 3D graphic and compute shader API created by Apple. Similar to OpenGL and OpenCL. Hey, I forgot about OpenCL. It can be compared to low level APIs on other platforms such as Vulkan and DirectX, DirectX 12. Uh, so OpenCL, Open Computing Language, is a framework for writing programs that execute, I guess, on among other things, GPUs, which is uh, created by Apple. So I'm not sure I understand the, the relationships between all of them, but that's fine. But those are different, some different backends of Ogre. So uh, I, I, we don't care about those. I think that those files are going to be about, um, Ogre is going to expose some um, um, uniform API to all those backends. And those files, I think, will mainly be about setting up the backends so that um, the, the uniform API correctly calls the things. Um, all right, so in Ogre main, uh, let me see if we can rule out Ogre media. We have some shader libs, some terrain, and some packs. So uh, we have things like shadows. Th these are .vert files. Um, assuming maybe like vertex files, like they, uh, I don't know if these are shaders or, or something, um, something GPU-ish, I think. Well, dot, um, GPU .vert files. Vert file. What is a dot vert file? It's used to shade a vertex. Okay. So it seems like, um, I don't know if that means that this is a shader file or if this is something that's called by a shader file. Vertex file. Let's ask AI. What is a dot vert file? in the context of 3D graphics. The vertex shader operates on each vertex of a 3D model performing transformations such as translation, rotation, scaling, and projection. Um, are there other shader files? I guess. So fragment shaders, okay. Yeah, I forgot about fragment shaders. Also, geometry shaders operate on whole entire primitives such as points, lines, and triangles. Tessellation shaders are used to subdivide geometry into smaller pieces, allowing for smoother surfaces in more detail. They're part of the tessellation stage in modern graphics pipelines. Compute shaders, or I guess are for computing, right? are not part of the traditional graphics pipeline, but are used for general purpose computing tasks on the GPU. Domain shaders uh, are like, I guess, DSO, are used in conjunction with tessellation shaders to control the output of tessellated patches. And fragment shaders variants. There may be specialized shaders for specific tasks, such as post-processing effect, screen space, reflections, and shadow mapping. Okay, that's useful. So this, this is some vertex shader. Um, and we've got some parameters uh, in, maybe inputs. It's going to take a uh, vec4, presumably, because we're working with quaternions. I'm going to guess this is the name. I don't know. It, maybe that's the thing that it's initially set to or something. Or maybe that's another argument. Um, and then another, uh, so, so some initial uv0 vector, a position vector. And in, in main, we are going to get the new position, extrusion and object space, vertex unmodified if W is one and, uh, so is unmodified if W is one and extruded if W is zero. We're just gonna get the um, XXXX from UV zero. What is XXXX? I, I don't know. We're gonna multiply it by the position, which I guess is the second input and add the light position object space, which uh, I guess is uh, defined here or, or named here. Maybe it's populated somewhere else. And then, uh, so, okay, so we, we essentially translated uh, this position somehow by this light thing, and then we scaled it, I guess, and then we subtracted the light thing, kind of doing... Um, uh, maybe think of this as like we have uh, an affine map, and so we're, we're 
uh, mapping it to a place where um, the this is uh, mapping it to the origin so that this is maybe something like a um, a linear map and then translating it back or something along those lines, basically conjugating it in the uh, in the group sense. Okay, and then we have um, ogre components and bullet is presumably going to be importing um, libraries from the from the bullet um, physics engine. C sharp and Java, these might be uh, ways to call ogre from C sharp and Java. C sharp maybe is interesting, especially because uh, Unity is in C sharp. I don't know if you can use ogre with Unity in any way. Um, mesh LOD generator. What is a LOD? I don't know. Um, but also uh, overlay is maybe thing like graphics that overlay other graphics. Paging. I don't know what kind of paging they might have. Um, property could be almost anything. Python is I'm going to assume Python bindings like Java and uh, C Sharp. And we also have terrain and volume. Volume is presumably some volume in 3D space. Terrain is possibly like some combination of a patch with a shade, with a, a, a texture. But um, I'm not sure if we're going to get to those, but let's definitely look at main. I think that's where the most of the stuff is going to be. Although that's media main. No, I don't want that. I want ogre main. Hello. Hey, wait, wait, wait. More actions. Keep above others. Is this not staying below? Welcome. <laughs> Hello, Aditya. For some reason, I can't move your uh, people below others. There we go. I'm coming. Okay. Well, <laughs> welcome. Um, all right. So here's, um, here's, let's look in source and then include probably just the headers, right? And, um, the, the downside of this, the downside of, um, this sort of organization is it's going to be difficult for me to, um, look at a header and then jump to its implementation. So I don't know what that means. Maybe that means that, um, Usually I look at the headers first. I guess I'll just do that. Maybe I'll try looking in um, Emacs. Maybe it'll be easier in Emacs to jump between header and definition. Uh, where are we? Ogre main. Okay. <laughs> All right. So ogre bone, we should definitely look at because the idea of ogre bones amuses me. We have camera, which is going to, uh, I think, essentially give you the um, the perspective uh, on the on whatever scene you're looking at. I keep hitting the wrong key. Um, codec, I guess we'll ignore billboard set. I don't know what a billboard is, but maybe um, maybe a billboard is like a plane in three dimensional space. I guess we'll look at billboard at least uh, quickly. If animation track, uh, animation animable, I guess we'll look at animation uh, at least briefly. Convex body, it's its own file. Um, maybe it's, it's for, there's some optimization for uh, for that. Deflate and deprecated. Mm, I'm not sure if deflate is. I'm gonna, I'll look at it. It may not be so interesting. Dynlib, dynamic lib, presumably entity might be um, really fundamental. File system stuff, I'll ignore. GPU program. I'm going to guess this is for organizing, sending stuff to the GPU. There's an ogre header file uh, that might be um, might be useful, might be just kind of like bookkeeping. Um, hardware buffer, buffer manager. So I guess we get some like custom buffer implementation and various extensions of it. But uh, I'll try to ignore some of that low level stuff if I can. Keyframe is, I guess, going to keep, <laughs> keep track of keyframes. Light might be interesting. LOD, I, I don't know what a LOD is. That's log. Let's look at log, LOD strategy. Manual object material. Material is maybe something like texture. We have, um, Three and 40 matrix implementations. 
um, meshes, a movable plane, a murmur hash, I guess some sort of hash, a node. Uh, I think we can safely ignore a node, but I'm going to guess that's going to be part of maybe like the scene graph, um, part of building up some sort of graph for for rendering or for for uh, animating or whatever the things we can do. We have particle effectors. I guess maybe these are things that affect particles, things that emit particles, a particle itself, a system of particles, a pass. I guess we'll look at pass. Maybe that's part of organizing computation on, on the graph. A plane. I'll ignore the plane and polygons. Um, a quaternion. We'll look at quaternion. 2D rectangle. Renderable. We'll look at. We have a queue and listeners for the queue. Uh, targets, a maybe platform targets. I uh, will skip that on first pass at least. A group manager. I guess things probably things that are grouped together that you can move around perhaps as one or or reason about or code about uh, as one. Root might be more might be more interesting than Node. Then we have scene node, uh, scene query, and scene manager. We'll look at manager and query on first pass, and then if, if something is interesting, we'll, we'll pull it up. Um, and then skeleton is, I'm going to guess, we have bones, and uh, bones and skeletons are typical ways of naming how you rig up animations. So I'm gonna guess this is likely animation related. Static geometry, that might be, uh, Kind of like a model of the topology of something like a um, a three D mesh ogre string, perhaps something like just a string representation that is efficient or whatever. Sub mesh, it's presumably going to be like a mesh that's a sub mesh or some subset of a mesh. Uh, tag point, I'm not sure. Uh, that could be a bunch of different things. Timer, their timer thing might be interesting. I'll just open the vectors because we open the matrices and uh, viewport and bounding box, I guess. And let's look at the work queue. There's a threading uh, folder, um, but I guess let's try, to, let's try to ignore it. All right, um, but I do see bitwise, which could be interesting bitwise algorithms. All right, so I've marked these up. Um, I don't have a good way of uh, like opening tabs in Emacs, but first of all, I can, make this wider and increase the font size. Let's start with um, ogre.h. And we have not that many uh, lines, but it's all included. So this is, uh, I think I said that ogre.h might be just bookkeeping and it is. So let's unmark this. What is sphere.h? I'm gonna guess sphere.h is a model of a sphere. We could look at sphere.h. Um, you can, so a sphere has a radius and a center as, as they do. And we can, we have like getters and setters on the param, on the parameterization. Um, we can do things like check whether it intersects another sphere and how do we do that? We look at the, the distance between the center, the, the two centers and check whether it's, um, bounded above by the, um, the uh the square root of of the sum of their radius sum of their radii um we can check whether a sphere intersects a box by calling math intersects on this in box and so that sounds like a pretty generic implementation but um maybe we'll see that in math and, and you know intersects a bunch of stuff um merge you can merge two spheres I'm not sure uh, what you would want that to do, but we can look at the implementation. We're gonna get the distance between the two centers and um, uh, take take the length, the squared length, and then we'll get the difference between the radiuses. And um, I'm not sure what we're doing. So. Uh, early out stuff we look at the the radius difference is bigger than or equal to the length squared um 
in which case, uh, yeah, okay, so one fully contains the other, in which case we do nothing. Mm, so, so to merge, let's say we have like a sphere bounding another sphere. Um, if we try to merge them and one contains the other, nothing happens. Um, otherwise, if the radius is, uh, the, if the difference in the radiuses, the square of it is bigger than or equal to the length squared, and one doesn't contain the other, um, the radius of a sphere is large compared to how far apart they are, I guess is the way to think about this. Then we, the new sphere, we set the center and radius to other. So I guess it kind of like absorbs the other sphere. Otherwise, we set the length to the, the square root of the, um, the distance between their centers. So um, it seems like they're going to maybe kind of meet at the midpoint. And that, that kind of looks like what we're doing here. So we're taking half the length uh, of the um, sum. of the, um, I'm not sure um, why it would make sense to merge spheres like that, but I guess occasionally you want to. Um, static geometry. Let's look at static geometry just because just because we're here. Namespace ogre. So we have uh, some comment. I don't know what this comment applies to. Maybe some function. Um, oh, to the class. Okay. So static geometry pre transforms and batches up mess. So pre transforms and batches up message for efficient use as static geometry in a scene. Modern graphics cards, aka GPUs, prefer to receive geometry in large batches. It is orders of magnitude faster to render 10 batches of 10,000 triangles than it is to, to render 10,000 batches of 10 triangles, even though both result in the same number of on-screen triangles. Therefore, it is important when you are rendering a lot of geometry to batch things up into as few rendering calls as possible. This class allows you to build a batched object from a series of entities in order to, better fit, to benefit from this behavior. Okay, so this is essentially, um, this is essentially like a buffer. So you maybe like as you request things that happen uh, you like buffer up things in batches. This is going to like intelligently um, ship things off um, as bulk operations, which is probably an, has an interesting implementation, but I don't think that's what most people are here for. So we're going to just move along. Here's skeleton. We have an anim we can assign an animation blend mode. I don't know what that means. So this average versus cumulative. In average, animations are applied by calculating a weighted average of all animations. Uh, I don't know what it means to average two animations. Um, animation and in cumulative, they're applied by calculating a weighted cumulative total. Okay. And uh, linked, we have the struct linked skeleton animation source. So I was under the impression that this was probably related to animations. It seems to be related to animations. A collection of bone objects used to animate a skinned mess. Skinned is, of course, means a mesh that has a skin, but also like skinned means its skin has been removed. Um, so I assume they mean the first version, but a skeleton, I guess, has in a sense been skinned. So you never know. Skeletal animation works by having a collection of bones, which are actually just joints with a position and orientation, arranged in a tree structure. For example, the wrist joint is a child of the elbow joint, which in turn is a child of the shoulder joint. Rotating the shoulder automatically moves the elbow and wrist as well due to this hierarchy. Yeah, so it moves it um, in, 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 in translation. I think it's just saying like if you, you know, uh, the, um, you know, like as you move your wrist, the location of your hand changes. I don't know if you can see my hand, but I'm doing this. But um, I don't think that means it. I don't think that means what it could mean, which is that you could have rotations like going down, like, um, uh, but that's that's fine. Um, one thing I've been curious about this is just a this is just an aside, but like if you think about like yoga poses, there's essentially I think a sense I think in which um, these yoga poses are um, like filling out a, a coordinate space for human skeletons, right? And so um, I wonder if anyone is built for like animators. Um, like a 
a library to kind of use use these poses as um, as starting points for um, for for animation. So, in fact, I'm going to ask Gemini. Um, I'd like to. Um, are there any libraries that uh, record the uh, rotational coordinates of bones corresponding to yoga poses uh, for use in uh, animation of humans in uh, animations of 3D models of humans, such as in video games or uh, uh, movies, <laughs> whatever you animate, whatever you animate humans as. You can use mocap, motion capture. Uh, all right. Fine. Um, what um, can you <laughs> generate a list of joint angles corresponding to downward dog? Let's see if you can do this. I don't know if the question even makes sense. All right. Thanks, Gemini, but no thanks. Okay. Where were we? We were in Emacs, right? All right. So skeletal animation works by having blah, blah, blah joints. Um, so how does this animate a mesh? Well, every vertex in a mesh is assigned to one or more bones, which affects its position when the bone is moved. If a vertex is assigned to more than one bone, then weights must be assigned to determine how much each bone affects the vertex. Actually, a weight of 1.0 is used for single bone assignments. Weighted vertex assignments are especially useful around the joints themselves to avoid pinching the mesh in this region. Therefore, by moving the skeleton using preset animations, we can animate the mesh. The advantage of using skeletal animations is that you store less animation data, especially as vertex counts increase. In addition, you are able to blend multiple animations together, e.g. walking and looking around, running and shooting, and provide smooth transitions between animations without incurring as much of an overhead as would be involved if you did this on the core vertex data. This is a wonderful comment. In general, um, it seems like this this project has great comments. If there was, um, if I wanted to be extra greedy, um, the it, it would be nice to have like um, like this is talking intelligently about why you wanted you know how do you want to um, animate people, why skeletons. It would be cool to have maybe a list of like books or or, or like a, maybe a couple of articles. Like resources, like um, if you want to think about animating skeletons in this way, the way that we've programmed them, then maybe here's like a, a thing so you can read background data or whatever, background info. But that, that that's great. The comments are really outstanding so far. All right, so a skeleton has a resource manager creator. This is presumably just some object that keeps track of and creates things that you can like pass around and, and configure. Um, a skeleton has a name, which May, might make you feel bad if you're killing skeletons like in Minecraft. So resource handle, some handle to some resource. What resource? Maybe the skeleton. I don't know. Um, a group, I guess maybe it belongs to some group. Is manual equals false. Um, I guess, uh, I'm not sure what manual is, but I guess you can have some either manual control or manual assignment of vertices or manual uh, animations. I don't know. And then some manual resource loader which is set to zero, presumably because by default is manual is false. And then we can create a bone, which uh, takes nothing and returns a bone. And so I guess the bone as created is not really attached anywhere. Yeah, here we go. This method creates an unattached new bone for the skeleton. Unless this is to be a root bone, there may be more than one of those. You must attach it to another bone in the skeleton using add child for it to be of any use. Okay, so you have to create some sort of like um, hierarchy of bones. Right? So uh, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, there may be um, so so skeletons aren't necessarily human skeletons, right? So they might be 
dog skeletons. They might be some um, like animated character that just is like two bones connected. They might be a snake. Um, but it, I don't know if they have, for example, like um, quadruped skeletons that you can like use as a starting point or biped skeletons or whatever. Um, but it also sounds like um, from a coding perspective, you don't have to assign it necessarily, but if you don't, then like nothing useful will happen. Note that this method automatically generates a handle for the bone, which you can retrieve using bone get handle. If you wish the new bone to have a specific handle, use the alternate form so you can, okay, so you can pass in a handle or whatever. Right, so you can create a bone with a handle. You can create bones in a bunch of different ways. Um, all right, you have a bone iterator, presumably for iterating over the skeletons. Get an iterator over the root bones of the skeleton. So that's get root bone iterator. You can get the root bones. It derives the root bone the first time you ask for it. The root bone is the only bone in the skeleton which has no parent. The skeleton locates it by taking the first bone in the list and going up the bone tree until there are no more parents and saves this top bone as the root. So um, uh, from a, now thinking in terms of graphs, in terms of rather than skeletons or 3D animation, um, we're taking a vertex of the graph and uh, walking up the parents but um, uh, that's going to give us a root bone, but not necessarily the root bone if we have a forest rather than a tree, for example. Um, so I don't know if it um, if it does this for every for every bone or if it just returns the first one it finds. If you're building the skeleton manually using create bone, then you must ensure that there's only one bone, which is not a child of another bone. Okay, so if you're building it manually, then you have to make sure there's only one, one root, essentially. Otherwise, the skeleton will not work properly. All right, fine. You thought of my, you thought of what I was talking about. Okay, so set binding pose. Sets the current position orientation to be the binding pose, i.e. the layout in which bones were originally bound to a mesh. Okay. Um, you can reset the position and orientation of all bones. You can create animation. You can return the animated object, et cetera. You can get animation, so gutter setters, all that stuff. Um, optimize all animations. Uh, I'm not sure how they optimize. Maybe there's a well-known algorithm. Maybe it's just like removing stuff that is redundant. Uh, this function, which we don't see yet, the name of, at linked skeleton animation source allows you to use the animations from another skeleton object to animate this skeleton. Okay, so maybe this is like if you have a model of a dog and you want to add a hyena, you can use the dog animations or whatever. All right, that's enough bones for now. That uh, I mean, skeletons. But let's look at bone. Uh, so bone should be <laughs> much simpler. Um, you can set binding pose. So it's the original position, orientation to be the binding pose. Okay, so I guess bones have binding poses as well, not just skeletons. Uh, a bone in a skeleton. See a skeleton for more information. Um, let's see. Uh, intentionally hide bone implementations of create child methods. This will also suppress warnings like uh, blah, 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 hides overloaded virtual functions. That's just some C++, C++ stuff. Um, so you can create a new bone. And what do you have? You give it a handle, a, uh, a translation vector, which is initially zero. So uh, basically the origin, if you think about this as linear space as opposed to affine space, and some quaternion, which is a rotation. And then I guess um, your bone is at, all of your bones start off in the same place, namely the origin, and you can move them around and rotate them. And that's all a bone is with a handle. So a bone, I guess, has no length. It just has... Um, or at least um, if there is a, mm, I don't know. How does a bone know how long it is? I guess it doesn't. It's just the joints, right? So the, a joint is just a point, I think is what they're saying. So handle the numeric handle. Sorry, handle is the numeric handle to give the new bone. It must be unique within the skeleton. Unique within the skeleton. So I guess you can reuse the name across skeletons. Um, so all of that is cool. The skeleton has a creator. Point her back to the creator for child creation. So uh, the creator in this case is a skeleton. 
And um, when we looked at skeleton, the creator was some other object. So maybe, mm, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you have to be a skeleton to create a bone. Okay, so that was fun. Um, let's look at animation now, I guess. Now we're on the animation kick. Animation. An animation container interface which allows generic access to sibling animations. All right. Because animation instances can be held by different kinds of classes, and there are sometimes instances when you need to reference other animation instances within the same container, this class allows generic access to be to named animations within that container, whatever it may be. Okay, so we have some container. We it's just basically a vector, <laughs> whatever. We get the number of it. We can get a specific animation at an index, and we can create and remove them. Here's an animation sequence which defines an interface, the sequence of animations, whether it's a mesh, a path along a spline, or possibly more than one type of animation in one. I don't know how, um, I don't know how um, a, a mesh is an animation. Oh, animation of a mesh. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, we have some interpolation mode, could be linear or spline, rotation interpolation mode, which could be linear or spherical. And uh, like setters and gutters for things like length, the total length of the animation, which is a real maybe length and time, I assume. I don't know what other ways an animation could have length. Um, we can create a node animation track, which I guess is assigning an animation to a node, a specific node, I guess, in the, in the scene graph or uh, object graph or whatever. And... We have a vertex animation craft, search track for animating a vert, animating vertex position data. Uh, I guess a vertex of some triangle in the in the geometry. Uh, node track. So maybe node is um, wait. I don't know. I don't know what the difference between node and vertex is. Maybe we can look at node, but. Uh, at any rate, you can assign, it seems like you can assign animations to node, to nodes and to vertices. And what else? You can apply, apply, applies an animation to a specific time point and weight. What does it mean to apply an animation to a time point? I guess, um, like queuing that animation at that time. When you have associated animation tracks with your objects, you can easily apply an animation to the objects by calling this method. So I guess the time position in which to to apply the animation, like maybe you want it to animate 30 seconds into whatever, whatever you're doing. Um, the influence to give this track, one for full influence, less to blend with other animations. So I guess if you maybe give your character or whatever multiple things to do it at the same time, um, it was talking about like averaging the animation. So maybe that's, um, maybe that's about... Uh, um, if you're giving them multiple possibly different things to do, then it'll somehow try to do all those things at the same time and, and it will weight them possibly in different ways. Um, you can also apply an animation to a node. Uh, you apply one to a skeleton, which we know all about now, and so on. And you can do things like set the interpolation mode. You can optimize the animations and, uh, and so on. So that, this is... Um, it doesn't tell us too much about what uh, oh, I'm in God mode. It doesn't tell us too much about what an animation is, but that's fine. We'll proceed along and find billboard. I'm going to guess is relatively boring. Now, given some of the stuff we've seen, um, a billboard is a primitive which always faces the camera in every frame. So I guess it's kind of like a plane that's always rotating toward the camera. Um, you might use it maybe for like a, re a reflective light, uh, like a diffuse thing diffuser reflector thing billboards can be used for special effects or some other trickery which requires the triangles to always be facing the camera no matter where it is yeah they have their geometry generated every frame depending on where the camera is and billboards are uh, blah 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 they're just the mechanism for rendering a range of effects such as particles it is other other what there's other classes which use billboards to create their individual effects. So the methods are quite generic. Why is super chat not being sent? What is super chat? Oh, are you trying to send me some sort of super chat in, uh, in YouTube? I don't know. That's a good question. 
Oh, I don't I don't know anything about uh YouTube. Is that a thing? Super chat? Manage super chat. I don't know. I don't know if there's something I can manage. I haven't turned anything off, so uh can I do this? That that's like all the super chats. That's top chats. This is live chat. I, I sorry, I don't know. I pause it. I can look into it after. Um so that if if there's something messed up on my end, I can I can try to fix it. But not that. Okay. Um ogre bitwise. I was guessing this is maybe bitwise algorithms. Um so we will uh we're kind of in 3D mode, so maybe let's hold off on the on, on that stuff first. So um, Ogre camera, we just saw things that are always pointed at a camera. So maybe now's the time to look at cameras. The camera is a viewpoint from which the scene will be rendered. Ogre renders scenes from a camera viewpoint into a buffer of some sort, normally a window or a texture, a subclass of a render target. Ogre cameras support both perspective projection, the default, meaning objects get smaller the further away they are, and orthographic pro projection, blueprint style, no decrease in sizing with distance. Each camera carries with it a style of rendering, for example, fully textured, flat shaded, or wire frame. We can have more than um, more than one camera and point to a, a can point at a single render target if required. Okay, so what do we? Ex the, uh, uh, this is basically this. Sh this should basically just be projective geometry, at least for the perspective camera. So. Um, I don't know the um, artist, projected geometry artist. <laughs> I guess kind of like this. This, uh, the, um, no. I don't know how, I don't know how best to convey this, but the point is that th this should basically be the application of a projective transformation of a camera. Uh, all right. Well, I'm, I don't think any of those are, are, um, are, are, uh, exactly what I want, but that's fine. Um, but basically you have some 3d space and you're looking at it through like a sheet of clear paper or whatever, um, a, a lens or a, a piece of glass. And then, um, that's going the, the, uh, you never like see the full 3d scene, right? You see always something through a perspective in particular, you know, you're always looking at like a monitor and, and, and that doesn't even really change with like uh, VR because you're always looking through your eyeballs. So your eyeballs will always like hit the, you know, if you have like the vision pro or whatever it's called, they'll, they'll always hit the screen, the, the, the curved plane in this case of the vision pro lens. Um, and so that has to be, that has to be modeled somehow in each of these 3d things. You need to have some model of like what the camera lens is. Um, and so that's, that's basically what this should be. It should be essentially like a plane. And then th this one happens to be configurable because we're not necessarily having perspective. We allow maybe like cartoony things where things don't get further away as they move away. I mean, I mean, don't get smaller as they move away. And so we have things like aspect ratio, presumably the aspect ratio of like the lens um, rendering distance, whether or not the rendering distance of objects should take effect for this camera. Uh, I don't know what rendering distance means. That might mean the getting smaller thing, or it might mean um, like if something is sufficiently far away, we consider it so small that we can just prune it from the tree of things that we have to render or whatever. The minimum pixel size, it's probably also maybe related to pruning or optimization. Derived orientation position of the camera, including reflection. So we have some uh, quaternion, I guess, for um, uh, uh, rotation, maybe, or or maybe um, anything. And then a derived position, which I guess is the uh, the translation away from the origin, uh, most likely. Um, and then, yeah, so I guess um, the orientation is, is given entirely by the quaternion. So when it says including reflection, it means more than just rotations, for example. 
Okay, the number of visible, visible faces in the last render. Uh, so I guess we rendered something and we need to know how many visible faces. I don't know why, maybe to tell us something about the um, the order of magnitude or whatever of the, of the scene we're rendering. And then visible, visible batches. Um, okay, and then we have things like the real world orientation of the camera. I don't know what that means. Um, real in what sense? <laughs> no idea. Um, and why is the previous one the derived one not real? Perhaps they're just different coordinate spaces. Maybe real is like more of a global coordinate space, and derived is possibly more of a um, a coordinate space that that we have more control over that we can choose to be optimal in some sense. And then we keep track of things like yaw whether to yaw around a fixed axis. And if we do yaw around a fixed axis, we'll keep track of which axis to yaw around, etc. More stuff about the quaternion orientation. I don't know, uh, uh, the camera orientation. I thought that's what we were doing up here. But maybe this is, I guess this is for nodeless positioning and this is for not nodeless positioning or something. I don't know. Um, okay, and... Uh, we have a viewing window, which is going to be like basically the lens that I was talking about, and more camera stuff. And we have keep track of the scene manager. This camera is rendering through a particular scene. And we can set polygon mode, etc. So just in the interest of seeing lots of stuff, we're just going to keep moving along rather than dig too much into any one thing. Convex body might be in let's see if we can get rid of it deflate. This is uh, importing zip. So maybe this is about zip files. Cache data, static buffer, static array, cache size, stream, which compresses and uncompresses data. Using the deflate. Yes, we can get rid of it. That's like data compression. Ogre entity. Uh, yeah, let's look quickly at it. Uh, we can add an entity to a group. Defines an instance of a discrete movable object based on a mesh. Ogre generally divides renderable objects into two groups discrete, aka separate and relatively small objects which uh, move around the world. Um, OK, sorry, discrete and small objects which move around the world, and large sprawling geometry, which makes up generally immovable scenery, aka level geometry. So these are things like um, like maybe like a building, like a skyscraper. The mesh and submesh classes deal with the definition of the geometry used by discrete movable objects. Entities are actual instances of objects based on this geometry in the world. Therefore, there is a single set mesh for a car, but there may be multiple entities based on it in the world. Okay, so that's useful. Um, so the, there may be, like, let's say that you are making Grand Theft Auto 3 clone, and you have some, um, some particular car, uh, and um, Every instantiation of that car will use the same mesh, but the cars are in different places. They're going at different speeds. So they are different instantiations of that mesh with different like vectors associated with them. Um, and those instantiations, it seems like, is, is what it's calling entities. entities. Entities are able to override aspects of the mesh it is defined by, such as changing material properties per instance. So you can have many cars using the same geometry, but different textures, for example. So you could have red cars and green cars. Um, or if you're making a Mortal Kombat uh, clone, you can have like the same character wearing yellow versus the same character <laughs> wearing green and call them different names and stuff. So because a mesh is split into submeshes for this purpose, the entity class is a grouping class, much like the mesh class class and much of the detail regarding individual changes is kept in the sub entity class. Cool. Um, so that tells us what it is. We can imagine what it, what we, we can imagine what the, the data structure is. First, there'll be a bunch of uh, just general methods and setters and getters for kind of like ogre specific bookkeeping stuff, like maybe like what is the thing that created this? What is the scene graph and stuff? And then it will have a mesh and then it will have um, essentially all the properties that you need to override the mesh, such as uh, where is it, uh, what's its orientation, um, and maybe if it's like shrinking or expanding it, uh, like a texture, um, maybe some sort of vector to, to indicate an acceleration. 
And so we have hardware vertex buffers. So we've got some uh, some buffery stuff. Uh, let's see what else. Skeleton animation info. I guess an entity um, may be a skeleton and may have some animations associated with it. Find buffer vertex data. Initialize pose vertex data. So I guess to initialize the the pose and orient. Um, you know, if you're a skeleton, initialize how your joints are oriented. The number of bone matrices. Bone world. <laughs> I don't know what bone world matrices are, but I like the idea of bone world. We have a set of all the entities which shares a single skeleton instance. This is only created if the entity is in fact sharing its skeleton instance with other entities. And so on. Um, and this is, there's tons of stuff here, uh, but I think it's a lot of detail and we have a sense of the... Oh, thank you. I did, yeah? That's awesome. I appreciate that. All right. So let's uh, move along here. All right, here's... Um, we're going to look at GPU program next. I guess so. I'm going to guess this might be um, like uh, computational GPU programs as opposed to uh, the classic uh, stuff that you expect Ogre to be able to do. Otherwise, I'm not sure why they would give the user direct access to, um, to the shading stuff since it seems like their goal is to provide a nice interface to all that stuff. But, but who knows? Maybe it is just about like shading entities and stuff. We have a GPU program type. It can be vertex, fragment, geometry, domain, hull, or compute. So I guess they do su support compute, and that's maybe what I was just saying. Hull, I'm going to guess, is like convex hull sort of stuff. And um, your GPT count. Oh, I'm sorry, these are GPT instead of GPU. I don't know. I guess GPU program type. T must be type. Um, and the count is the, the program plus one. I'm not sure why, but that's what it is. I guess to adjust for an off by one error. A GPU program extends resource, which is probably like a generic object of some source, some sort. It defines a program which runs on the GPU, such as a vertex or fragment program. It defines a low level program in assembler code. The sort to be uh, the sort used to directly assemble into machine instructions for the GPU to execute by nature. This means that the assembler source is render system specific, which is why this is an abstract class. Okay, so um, individual, it'll have to be implemented um, by each backend, essentially. Whoever's implementing the backend, your job is to implement GPU program, um, among other things. And we have things like the where is the, where is the file defining this program? Does this vertex program, program include morph animation? What? Is that a separate kind of animation? What is what is morphing in animation? Morphing versus tweening. I guess it is. Uh, it transforms special film special effects in the late twentieth century through films like Terminator Two. Okay, it's an effect where one sees a shape or object transform into another in a seamless transition. There are different approaches but the fundamental meaning of morphing remains the same. Okay, so I'm familiar with the morphing effect. Um, I'm not really uh, familiar with how or why it's a different sort of thing than, than tweening, but I guess it makes sense. I think tweening is like you draw, you know, in, in like Disney style cell animations, you draw, you know, uh, Goofy with his hand in one position and then you draw Goofy with his hand in another position and somehow you like interpolate between those or you higher, um, uh, less, you know, uh, animators lower on the totem pole to, to, to draw the in-between frames or whatever. Um, but somehow morph is, is doing something else and the GPU, the GPU program class needs to know about that. Pass fog states. What's a fog state? Returns whether a fragment program wants fog state to be created through fixed pipeline, low level API rendering calls. What is a fog state? This is like um, modeling fog. GPU fog state. <laughs> Force your GPU into a P0 state. Why is fogs in games exponential and has a start distance?
fog start. So NVIDIA has this fog start thing. It takes a uh, start as a float, I guess. Specify the near distance used in the linear fog equation. See GL fog start description in OpenGL, GL fog manual page for details. I guess this is just adding fog. GL fog. Specify fog parameters. Thank you, but what is it? Fog is initially disabled. When enabled, fog affects rasterized geometry, bitmaps, and pixel blocks, but not buffer clear operations. To enable and disable fog, call GL enable and GL disable with fog. Yeah, but what does it do? Blends a fog color with each rasterized pixel fragments post texturizing color using a blending factor. It sounds like it might be fogging things up. I don't know if it's for um, uh, making a fog effect like this or if it's just some sort of smoothing operation. What is, uh, what's up with GL fog? Uh, fog effect near 3D scenes, uh, blah, blah, blah. Is this so? Is this used um, to um, model actual fog, as in the weather, the weather condition, or is it um, fog in some uh, technical sense? Uh, can be similar to atmospheric fog. It's important to understand that it's a rendering technique rather than a physically accurate simulation. <laughs> Actual fog is caused by tiny weather droplets. Yeah. Uh, the GL fog start controls the gradual fading of object visibility based on distance from the viewer. That's kind of like fog. Density is controlled by a single parameter. It doesn't account real, for real world factors. It creates a visual clue of depth and atmosphere, but doesn't re replicate the physics of an actual fog. Let's see. They draw a picture, draw a picture of, of a, um, of a sailor, um, disappearing into the fog while programming on his laptop. Can you do it? Cool, but make it make it foggier, much foggier. And make the laptop uh, into a um, IBM mainframe. We'll come back to it. Okay. Um, all right. So the fog really does seem to be fog. I'm gonna just close out Firefox altogether. Uh, but so that that's interesting. I didn't know that that was like a, a thing that um, GPUs can do. It makes sense, I guess. Uh, you have this kind of blurring thing. It's um, uh, if it's easy to calculate and people people like to use it for games, make it available. That is a, is is pretty reasonable. Here's Ogre Light. This should be just some modeling of a light source. So um, I, you need a light source to know how how things are lit, like what the shadows are, what the reflections are. Um, I don't know if everyone like uses ray tracing for everything or if ray tracing is just a, um, an optimization used in some cases, but in some sense, this should be a source of light. Um, so lights are used representation of a, dy a dynamic light source. So I guess it can change like flicker, like a candle or whatever. It could probably also be static. Lights are added to the scene like any other object. They contain various parameters like type attenuation, how light intensity fades with distance, color, etc. The light color is computed based on Direct3D light model. And uh, I can't really read this through the um, LaTeX, but um, it, I don't know if C dot is standard multiplication or if it's supposed to be a dot product, but I think these are, these are supposed to be scalars. And I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Um, but I'm sure in the render documentation, it's more clear. But this is some light source. 
Uh, light color is computed based on some equation. I like that they give us the equation. That's super useful. Again, this is a great comment. All of these comments have been really good. Uh, so CD, um, I think F is just this delimiter thing. So CD is the diffuse color. And I guess we're British because we're using the British spelling. CS is the specular color. I forget what specular versus diffuse is. It's like specular, the concentrated diffuse color light. So specular light is less diffuse, <laughs> diffuse than regular light. So is this like um, this uh, related to um, smoother surfaces will keep smoother surfaces will keep specular reflections focused, which can appear to look brighter and more intense. So it looks shinier. You can see things in them like a mirror, uh, a, a mirror polish. Rougher surfaces have larger, dimmer highlight, but the intensity remains the same. I don't know um, how that. Uh, what that means about color. I don't know if the color is used for like shading and shadow or if the colors, if they're different colors for some other reason. The defaults when the light is created is pure white diffuse light with no attenuation. So um, it doesn't get, it doesn't get dimmer, I guess, as you take it further away. Lights are created using the scene manager create light method. Okay. Remember also that dynamic lights rely on modifying the color of vertices based on the position of the light compared to an object's vertex normals. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, um, we need to know what it means for a light to shine on an object. And the way that we do that is that the object is represented by vertices. And it's um, the way that a light affects the color of an object. Well, the vertex has some color and the light is going to change it. And the way that it changes it is somehow computed from um, the object's vertex normals. So the 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 normals are um, uh, kind of an indication of uh, for like a plane or a triangle, something planar um, is an indication of what uh, what position is it's pointing toward. I don't know um, how uh, graphics people define a vertex normal because um, uh, the the dual of a, a vertex should be a point. The dual of a point should be a plane. Um, but normals it normally means, I think, um, uh, a vector. So uh, maybe let's look look up what I mean by that. But but basically, based on the orientation and things like the distance to the light, it'll change the color of the mesh. Dynamic lighting will only look good if the object being lit has a fair level of tessellation. Okay, I guess uh, maybe this just means subdivision. And normals are properly set. So if you have like a blocky low polygon uh, model, then um, because the, the, the planes are, are large, essentially, it won't, the shadowing won't particularly good, look good. This is particularly true um, for a spotlight, which will only look bright on highly tessellated models. In the future, ochre may uh, be extended for certain scene types to an alternative to the standard dynamic lighting may be used such as dynamic light maps, which I guess is I, maybe instead of having a, a simulated light is maybe something more like a texture that contains light information about it for, in every pixel. So um, what's that um, artist head? It's like some low, like low poly artist head model. Um, planes. Yeah because a sorrow head or something like that. So here's an example. <laughs> you can imagine, like this is an example where uh, this is kind of like an uncanny valley thing where this person's chin is a single plane. And I think that what that is saying is that like, if you don't have enough uh, subdivisions of your polygon, then the shadowing is going to look a little bit weird. So this face has a reasonable number of subdivisions, so it's not totally bad. But um, uh, as you get worse and worse, it, the the lighting should look worse. So low poly uh, human 3D. This is pretty low polygon count. Um, you can like count the number of, of polygons on the on the uh, body without without too much effort. Um, and then uh, what was I going to look up? Vertex normal. 
I think that this is a standard thing, and I, I think I used to know um, how they defined it. So the um, vertex normals to set to hard here, vertex normal set to soft here. I guess maybe it's the normal of um, at the vertex, we're thinking of this as a place where multiple lines meet. And uh, we're taking like a normal to all of the uh, all of the lines in some sense. Something like that. Here we go. Vertex normal. In geometry of computer graphics, a vertex normal at a vertex of a polyhedron. So it's only defined for polyhedrons. Okay. So it's not defined, for example, for like a single point, uh, which is, I guess, my main concern. The directional vector associated with a vertex intended as a replacement for the true geometry, the, the true geometric normal of the surface. Commonly, it's computed as the normalized average of the surface normals of the faces that contain that vertex. Okay, yeah, that's that's ringing a bell. So you take all of the, um, so here's a polyhedron. It has, uh, in this case, one, two, three, four, five um, triangles that are in the same plane. And these triangles all say share a normal, which is pointing out like this. And um, each vertex is, in this case, the meeting point of uh, one, two, three, uh, I guess if you want to, mm, at least three, let's, let's pretend that there are three here, um, lines. And, um, to get the vertex normal, we basically, uh, the, uh, average these normal somehow. So this one points up, this one points kind of left, uh, tilted left, this one points tilted right. Then we take their average. That's basically like um, taking a, a plane in which these these three centers are coplanar, and then taking the normal to that plane is, I guess, the sort of thing we're ap approximating. The average can be weighted, for example, by the area of the face, or it can be unweighted. Vector normals can also be computed for the polygonal approximations to surfaces such as NURBS, or, or explicitly for artistic purposes. Vector normals are used in uh, Giro shading. Okay, cool. So that's a vector norm normal. It's uh, well-defined and a reasonable uh, approximation for the geometry. And what else? Um, I think that's enough light for me. Uh, just so we can get to other things. I think we're going pretty long, aren't we? Well, not too long. Uh, LOD strategy, I just was curious what a LOD is. LOD, level of detail, a strategy for determine the, determining the level of detail. Generally, to create a new LOD strategy, all the following will need to be implemented. Get value, impl, get base value. Okay, so this is kind of like level of detail, like zooming in, zooming out, maybe. Um, ogre material. Uh... I'm going to guess this is mainly like a texture thing. Class encapsulates rendering properties of an object. Okay, so rendering properties in general. Hello, Wanderson source. Good to see you. Um, it also, okay, so all aspects of the visual appearance of an object. Okay, that's fine. We're, we'll, <laughs> we'll ignore, we'll move on. Um, uh, math and matrix. Um, We'll just quickly scan over, see if there's any any interesting comments. So we have um, a matrix. So we're in matrix 4.h, and we have the class matrix 4 and the class affine 3. And um, we have, uh, I guess this is overloading the, the star operator for two matrices so that you can um, multiply them. Class encapsulating a standard 4x4 homogeneous matrix. Ogre uses column vectors. And applying matrix multiplications, which I think is relatively uh, common. That's the standard way, right? This means a vector is represented as a single column, four row. Oh, wait, what? It's a single column, four row matrix. Okay. This has the effect that the transformations implemented by the matrices happens right to left. For example, if vector V is to be transformed by M1, then M2, then M3, the calculation would be 
m3 dot times m2 times n1 times v. That's the standard, uh, the standard way. This is do m1, then do m2, then do m3, right? Yeah. The use of column vectors and right to left ordering is the standard in most mathematical texts. Okay, there we go. And it's the same as used by OpenGL. It is, however, the opposite of Direct 3D, which has inexplicably chosen to differ from the accepted standard and uses row vectors and left to right matrix multiplication. I'm not sure it's inexplicable. I'm sure um, there are <laughs> there are reasons such as uh, the fact that uh, M1, then M2, then M3, you have to reverse this. You have to just keep in, keep in, in mind that that's how you do function application, but maybe there's some reason that uh i guess microsoft is in charge of direct 3d right maybe they had some reason that their way was faster um and these are all just uh uh matrix uh matrix routines and stuff make inverse for transform i guess uh, you can give it a transform and get the um, matrix inverse and so on um okay so the quaternions are maybe in here are they in here uh, deprecated quaternion extract. You can um, pass in a quaternion and get uh, and get an inverse. I don't know if there's a separate quaternion. Um, but yeah, there's a separate quaternion implementation. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, I guess we don't really need to learn look at matrix three. That's I think probably going to be just the translations, just used for. Um, well, they've got three-dimensional matrices. I don't know. So far, they've mainly used three vectors uh, as translations. Um, here is what math. So this just should be more math routines. We have ray test result, a pair structure where the first element indicates whether an intersection occurs. So you can, I guess, see if two rays occur, uh, 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 intersect. We have an implementation of radians, which you can do things like add, multiply, so um, so this looks like a fun class. Again, um, it would, it, there should be some generic version of all this stuff, and, and maybe that's what things like Bullet are about, or, or um, either ChatBT or Gemini gave me a list of some open source ones. Um, here's degrees, I guess, if you don't like radians. Angles, which I guess can be either radians or degrees. And here's some math, common functions angle units used by the API, and so on. Uh, cosine, presumably we have sine somewhere, ceiling. Saturate, simulate the shader function saturate that clamps a parameter value between zero and one. Okay, so this is some um, common shader function that we're providing an implementation of. All right, here's sine, here's square root. Okay, oh, math. I'm not going to look at the implementation just because we're low on time. Ogre mesh, I'm just going to ignore Sorry, mesh. Um, particle effector and emitter, I will ignore in the interest of time, but I will look at particle just to see if there's anything like a fun comment. So, particles uh, are either a visual particle or an emitter. They have a width and height and a rotation and a position. But here, rotation is a um, radian and um, it seems like before they were using uh, um, quaternions to, to give like an orientation. So I don't know um, why we're using a, a radian in this case. And uh, is a particle necessarily 2D? Maybe a particle is 2D for some reason. Um, although they have a 3D position and direction, so I guess not. Note the intentional public access to internal variables. Accessing via get set would be too costly for the zero, zero, zeros, maybe thousands, it means, of particles. All right. And then we have a color, the time to live. Um, so I guess particles are uh, mainly used when there's maybe like a lot of them, like a particle simulation where there's like dust or uh, something like that, as opposed to maybe something like sprites. I don't really know uh, enough about graphics to know um, when you call something a particle versus something else. A uh, particle might be rotating, particle type, etc. And you can get your width and height. So just ref 
just for funsies. Let's hook up um, particle simulation. Maybe let's throw an ogre there. Yeah, so I guess like particles is meant for this sort of thing. What are you downloading? Not opening. Uh, where there's lots of them. Fine. Sounds good. Okay, so that's enough particles for me. Particle system is some be <laughs> some system of particles. Pass, I think it's going to be about um uh, like like render passes or, or similar things. Uh, we have illumination stage, which has things like is it is it ambient, is it a decal, is it unknown? Class defining a single pass of a technique of a material. So we saw a technique in um the OBS code. I wasn't really sure what it was, but maybe it's a generic thing. The pass does not explicitly use a vertex or a shader fragment. Ogre will calculate lighting based on the direct 3D model. Okay. So uh, a technique might have a parent. It has a name and a hash and some color properties like ambient, diffuse, specular, emissive. And some information about depth, calling mode, uh, the max number of simultaneous lights, and so on. And is there anything else that I want to get out of this? Um, do we have the, the word render? I'm not sure. Okay, I mean, this programmable passes. Programmable passes are complex to define because they require custom programs. You have to set all constant inputs to the programs, like the position of lights, etc. But they do give you much total flexibility over the algorithms used to render your passes. You can create some effects which are impossible with a fixed function pass. On the other hand, you can define a fixed function pass in, er in very little time, and you can use a range of fixed function effects like environment mapping very easily. Okay, so there's, there's this, this trade-off between whether you want to implement your own passes or use uh, the ones that are provided to you with some uh, cleverness. I guess we'll ignore Quaternion. Um, a renderable, I'm going to guess, is something that could be rendered. Um, and we're just kind of blazing along now. Scene manager. Uh, should we look at root? I guess we'll do a quick look at root just to see if it tells us anything about the, the tree that they're using. The root class of the ogre system. The ogre root class represents a starting point for the client application. From here, the application can gain access to the fundamentals of the system, namely the rendering systems available, the management of saved configurations, logging, and access to other classes in the system. Acts as a hub from which all other objects may be reached. Okay, so this is um, root in a sense, but it's not root of what I thought it was, which was something like the, the scene tree. This is more like the entry point to the API, which is uh, which is cool, but we're going to um, not spend too much time on it. Scene manager, I'm just going to ignore. Scene query, I, I'm just kind of curious what, I guess this is like finding things within a scene. We have a world fragment, a class for performing queries on a scene. Uh, for example, I, think, I mean, this says, um, like IE is specifically, I think they mean EG, for example, to retrieve a list of objects and or world geometry sections, or maybe they do mean IE, uh, uh, which are, uh, potentially intersecting a given region. So one of the things you can query is like, you have some region and you want to know, um, what's in it and uh, maybe just so that you want to render those things or you want to like explode them all. Note the use of the word potentially. The results of a scene query are generated based on bounding volumes and as such are not correct at a triangle level. The use of scene query is expected to filter out results further if greater accuracy is required. The user of scene query. Okay, so this is, um, we're doing a fast query and getting a list of candidates. And then it's like your job um, to prune the rest of the candidates. And the trade-off there is that um, it would be much slower to query, I guess, the triangles directly. And so it's it's much uh, higher performance to uh, query the larger thing and then let the, let the caller of the function decide which of those objects they really need to worry about. Different scene managers will implement these queries in different ways to exploit their particular scene organization and thus will provide their own concrete subclasses. In fact, these subclasses will be derived from subclass of this class 
rather than directly because there will be region type classes in between. Okay, so um, that's cool. I'm going to move along though. I, I have to go in a few minutes. Poker timer, I'll ignore. 2D and 3D uh, vectors, we can ignore. Viewport, I feel like we've talked a little bit about viewports um, when we were talking about um, cameras. So I'll mostly ignore this. this. This might also have support for like the, the UI interpretation of viewport. Um, I don't know if Ogre 3D is just the library or if they have a, um, if they have like a UI in the way that, that Blender does. Um, I'll try this. So I get lots of pictures of an ogre. It's a little bit hard to um, do an image search for. About ogre 3D. So I, I don't know if um, Skyline Game Engine reaches public beta. Where's ogre? Thanks to your awesome ogre 3D rendering solution. See, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is a picture of Skyline or um, or ogre. Us free screenshots of their editor and some sample scenes. Let's see if we can zoom in on the what what what. I don't get to open the image. Yeah, so this is some other program I guess called Skyline that is I think using Ogre under the hood. So I I, I don't think Ogre has UI elements. We certainly haven't seen any UI elements, but so I'm going to guess based on that that viewport is just the uh, the abstract model of a viewport as opposed to something like you might see as you open up um, a 3D game programming environment. And bounding box, and we're, we're going to ignore work queue, um, might be interesting if we were digging into uh, things like performance, but um, I have to, I have other obligations <laughs> that I need to get to. I think I'm gonna cut it off here. Although I do wanna see how Gemini did with this, um, with this foggy, this is not bad. Um, this one has a mainframe computer, but it's not very foggy. So I guess it's foggy in the background. All right. So that's all for me. Um, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that Ogre 3D. I will not be doing nearly as many of these next week, um, but I'll probably do at least one potentially on Friday, potentially on Monday. I'm not sure. I'll throw up a schedule as I know more about um, what my other obligations are. But thanks for watching.